I have a special guest today. This is Chris Gagné. And uh, Chris is an experienced Agile coach, senior product leader, and meditation teacher in San Francisco, California. He guides teams through the Agile transformation so that they can complete twice the work with twice the joy in half the time. He also designs, develops, and ships innovative products that delight customers, create value, and do good in the world. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks, Adolfo. Nice to see you. Okay, Chris. So the product owner must continuously engage the customer and stakeholder to ensure the team is building the right product. How do you get a sense and ensure the customer and stakeholders are getting it or not? How do you measure or verify that the stakeholder or customer understands what the product does or should do? Yeah, that's a great question, Adolfo. Well, if you can't describe your product or vision in several words, your customer or stakeholder probably won't understand what the product does or should do. And I think the best litmus test is simply their facial expression, body language, and verbal response when you explain it to them. And yes, this means that you should be having most of these conversations in person. Hmm. We can elaborate on this, of course. There are two ways of doing this, both of which are appropriate at different times in the product development cycle. At the beginning of the cycle, we'll have some fabulous ideas for a product. And at this point, it's a good idea to create a quick prototype of the idea and start showing it to your customers. It should be ugly enough that it doesn't take you too long to create, and your customer doesn't get stuck on irrelevant details like font colors or logos, but also mm -hmm. should be clear enough that your customer could under, uh, imagine themselves using the product in their context. And again, I recommend doing this in person, if at all possible, with two people from your team. You want to use your experience researcher leading the interview, and you want the product manager just taking notes. Mm -hmm. And record, if at all possible, um, with your customer's uh, permission. That will help you go back, review the video, and pick up on anything that you didn't catch the first time around when you're taking notes. Another suggestion that I have is immediately after your customer interview, debrief with your product owner, your user experience person, immediately afterwards, and begin to take notes and come up with your conclusions. It's a lot easier to do then when the interview is fresh in your mind and a lot harder several hours later after you've spoken to a few different customers and you're saying to yourself, gosh, what did we talk about with Bob? Mm -hmm. So that can make a big difference. Um, and if people get excited about what you're showing them and start trying to give you enhancement ideas, you're probably onto something. Mm -hmm. But don't stop there. Ask about the problems you're trying to solve. What mm -hmm. would that proposed feature allow you to do? Better yet, and more importantly, I think, what other products would they stop paying for uh, and it's so they can start using your product and why? That's where you can actually deliver some value for your customers and extract some of that for yourself. That's great. Again, I like the uh, position of letting the UX researcher drive the interview. I've seen very often where the the product owner or the product manager sort of, you know, tends to take on that role almost and starts prototyping and throwing things up on screen, low fidelity, things like that yep. uh, from the get-go. Absolutely. And one of the advantages of having a user experience researcher to do this is they simply have more experienced than most product managers. And they also don't have their bacon on the line in the same way. The product mm -hmm. owner is really attached to people mm -hmm. liking their product. And of course, your user experience person will also have that same feeling as well. And in fact, it's one of the reasons why it may, if possible, be better to have another user experience person besides the one who did the interview, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, uh, did the design, conduct the interview, because that will allow you to have somebody with a more neutral perspective uh, do the testing for you. Mm -hmm. I like that. Indeed. Uh, so that's kind of at the beginning of the cycle. And um, you know, once you've said, OK, we have a great idea. Let's start rolling with it. Uh, then we begin to do iterative feature development. And we start getting feedback from our customers based on actual product. Hmm. That's wonderful. So allowing, and a lot of it, too, is allowing those expertise to sort of do what they're trained to do. You know? Yes, absolutely. Leverage the skills that you have. Now we're having fun with the dog here, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK. So Chris, how can we detect if the product is not fulfilling the customer stakeholder's needs or expectations? Yeah. Well, if you're following Scrum, I think Sprint Review is going to be one good place to do that. And I think a lot of people think of Sprint Review as some dog and pony show for your pointy hair managers. You know, show me what you've accomplished with our big budget. And I really don't like that perspective. It's not really what that's about. It's about your opportunity to celebrate your team's accomplishment and get real, honest feedback about your work. Of course, this only works if you're shipping well-written vertical user stories. Okay. 
<laughs> and if you can start user acceptance testing earlier in the process, that's even better. There's no reason why a mature team can't ship an increment to at least a demo or staging environment and get real user feedback every single week, if not even more often. And shipping to production is even better. Wow, so there's a lot of lot of stuff right there. So uh, well-written stories in general is an art to itself. Yes. yes, it's an art and science, and it takes a lot of getting used to. I think if you hmm. if are relatively new to product management, in some ways you're actually in better shape to write well-written user stories than if you've been doing for a long time. For a lot of folks, Scrum and Agile is new, and yeah. so they may have spent their entire career writing these big, long, detailed project requirement documents, mm -hmm. and they write their user stories as if they're just you know, painting by numbers rather than doing a pencil sketch and then doing a color study and then beginning to fill in the details as they show each iteration to their customer. We describe this as the difference between incremental versus iterative feature development. If things aren't going right, you get the sense of that. Um, how, how do you course correct? Yeah. All of Agile is designed for rapid learning. Every single Agile event and interaction is an opportunity to inspect and adapt. And the way that I like to think about this is plan, but as soon as you're done planning, give up attachment to your plan. That's why the fourth line of the Agile Manifesto is responding to change over following a plan. So course corrections are really the manifestation of learning. And before one you can learn, you have to be willing to admit that you didn't know or didn't understand, or I think even more importantly, that you were wrong. And mm -hmm. from there, the rest is really the same planning in the first place. Think not too much about what you know, chart a rough course of action, get moving. The worst case scenario, possibly, or maybe not, that could be a mischaracterization, is um, have you terminated a sprint uh, if, it, if it's determined that a drastic change in direction is required? And if so, can you please explain this scenario and, and what you learned? Yes. So the abnormal termination of a sprint is a very strong action that in my mind carries a connotation of failure. And I'll be perfectly honest with Adolfo, I don't remember a single time in my career where I've wanted to use it. Hmm. So sprints are usually terminated because there's a few reasons. Uh, usually because there's a change in product direction, uh, the work that we're doing is no longer valuable, or things are taking much longer than expected and we no longer think it's valuable at that cost. Hmm. But rarely would this apply to every story in the sprint backlog. And this shouldn't happen on mature teams with strong product managers very often. And if it does happen on your mature team, why not just get together, discuss, and decide what to do next? Right. Ideally, you've already got at least half a sprint of ready stories in your team backlog anyway, because you went into sprint planning with one and a half to two sprints worth of ready stories. So you could always just drop that one story and pick up another. You don't need to go through a whole round of review, retrospective, and sprint planning again. And besides, if you're in cadence with other teams, your sprints, you're following the same schedule, why lose that? Now, you might have an immature team. You say, well, gosh, you know, maybe we need to kind of really make a break here, really make a point. But for an immature team, they're already in chaos. Start them with one-week sprints. That way, if you fail, you're just going to fail faster. If you're running one-week sprints, your next sprint is going to start in an average of two and a half days. It's literally just next week. So it's okay if they fail. We can learn from that. But there's no reason to rub anybody's nose in it. Right. So as a coach, you know, going from product manager to coach, again, I, I, I've worked with probably two dozen teams now, and I'm having a really hard time thinking of a time where I would have wanted to recommend a termination to the team for the v very same reasons. I think we can work through it with less trauma just by talking openly and honestly with each other. I mean, after all, we're a team. So shorten shorten your experiments, fail early, fail often, so to, so to speak. Yeah, uh, and make the failure safe. You don't have to make this big drama explosion unless you're really trying to drive home a point. But again, I don't think that you need to be that abrasive and direct with most teams. Well, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Adolfo.